It was a conspiracy. I was told that council was using this kidnap fiasco to try to get rid of him. Since graced tourism, magazine covers and pamphlets, bumper stickers, council letterheads, and numerous company advertisements. He was passionate about this town. Every grand final they dress up in the team colours, parading in the middle of the mall. Most people don't know this about them though. He was actually a Yank. Not too long ago, a guy walked into the shop where I worked and asked me where he could find the guy that I knew as Jocko Graves. He told me that he brought his entire family up from Sydney and to go to Morpeth and felt that it was also the perfect opportunity to visit Maitland and find Jocko, to uh, see him with his own eyes, as he put it. Um, the man said he, he was brought up on stories from Jocko and what he'd done for Maitland. Um, from his father and thought, well, while the family was with him, he um, might check him out and um, track him down himself. Jocko Graves, an immigrant from the United States, had been in Maitland for a very long time. He has lived to witness the career of Les Darcy, the 1955 flood, and even the arrival of Princess Diana and Prince Charles in 1982. Since the construction of the Heritage Mall back in 1988, he has since left the public eye and seemingly gone into hiding, thus leaving a lot of us wondering whether he even exists anymore. It is believed that his history and troubled past, the colour of his skin and, most importantly, what he came to represent, all contributed to his fall from grace and his absence from the public eye, yet it hasn't stopped people thinking about him. The people of Maitland, the Central Business District, and tourism departments, once Jocko's greatest allies for his tireless work in the community, are now embarrassed and choose not to acknowledge his contribution to tourism and his part in making Maitland the town it is today. They refer to him now as it, him, and the belittling term of Maitland's little icon due to his famously short stature. It seems through his many years Jocko has been known by many names, but nothing so disrespectful. It seems that his past is becoming more mythical as time moves on. When pushed, people do have memories of his greatness, and how he affected their lives, and the countless generations before them. Yet the question remains, what happened to Maitland's Jocko Graves? It's December 25th, 1776. On this, a cold Christmas night, General George Washington and a small army are riding by horse and about to cross the Delaware River at McConkie's Ferry in Bucks Country, Pennsylvania. He's going to attack a Hessian garrison 1,500 men strong in the New Jersey town of Trenton. Mr. Washington and his men were tired and exhausted. Most of them haven't slept for days and days. Although he was promised more men to help with the war, he knew they wouldn't arrive in time. It was soon realised if George Washington didn't act quickly and attack with the men he had, it would only be a matter of time before his army would fade away from being tired and the war would be over. A sudden strike to the garrison at Trenton would give him and his men the upper hand, but would also serve as an equally important morale boost for him and his men. As by the end of 1776, the fight for independence from the British was slowly beginning to appear unwinnable. It would seem that the success of the whole revolution would rest on the shoulders of Washington's men at Trenton. If they managed a victory there, Surely it would lift the spirits of the rest of the rebel forts. The fight for independence would still be a reality.
Legend has it a man by the name of Tom Graves joined George Washington's army and was taking part in this attack. Grace had a 12-year-old son who also wanted to join the battle and fight alongside his father. But of course he was too young. At any rate, the younger Graves was determined not to miss out and was acutely aware of the importance of the revolution to the American people. He decided to go anyway. As Washington was preparing to cross the Delaware River for the Battle of Trenton, he realised that he could not ferry all of his horses across the river at the same time. Some of his steeds would have to wait on the other side. The 12 year old Graves volunteered to hold the horses and make sure that they were ready when Washington's troops arrived. Jocko's history is a little obscure and it is hard to separate fact from myth. However, he apparently arrived in Maitland as part of a company, Friend & Co, a US-based founder. He immediately fell in love with Maitland, began working full-time in High Street and stayed there for the next 80 years. Jocko worked pretty tirelessly within the community, dividing his time up with McDonald's tobacconist, working as one of the country's first workers. He soon became a popular face for tourism. Jocko worked on fundraising, RSL-related work, and he helped with council issues and promotions. With the arrival of the Heritage Mall in 1988, although very outspoken in his views against it, he still found the time to be the face of all the promotions, and because of his love for the town, did everything he could to show the world what Mate is all about. Jocko became so popular that his popularity began to work against him. He was taken for granted and soon became a cause for embarrassment. He was a symbol for Maitland and consequently brought unwanted attention and publicity. A key point in the downfall of Jocko Grace occurred on one particular dark and stormy night when after a big day of working on his beloved high street, he was brutally attacked and kidnapped. People searched for days and days, fearing the worst, and he finally turned up battered and bruised, but in pretty good shape, especially for his age. Council and CBD management were scared and worried, citing age as a consideration. The council decided to forcefully retire Jocko and find a replacement. Nothing official was ever released to the public, but a lot of people felt that this is the last nail in the coffin for Jocko, a man who loved his adopted town, and who was forced to stop doing what he loved. The guy who loved my life. He would die from mainland. This count comes along and stops him from doing what he loves. I remember taking my daughter to see him, because I know my mother did the same with me. We used to go to Gorton's every year at Christmas. And we'd see him in the street, sometimes with a broom in his hand sweeping. We'd walk past him and wish him a Merry Christmas. My kids and I went down High Street when we first came here. And they said, who's that? I said, I don't know, let's go and have a look and you know, say hello to him. So they did, patted him on the head, and uh, yeah, we got to know him really well, because we'd go past there quite often down and uh, uh, see what had happened to him. I always heard these stories about people spitting on him, pissing on him whilst he was sweeping, you know, with his broom like that sort of thing. But they were jerks, no respect. No respect, I tell you. Everyone I've spoken to thinks he's an Aboriginal. He was passionate about this town. Every grand final they dress up in the team colours, parading in the middle of the mall. Most people don't know this about the man. He was actually a Yank. It really makes me sad that they don't recognise how much he's done for the community. He's an icon, a legend. I was told that the council was using this kidnap fiasco as a chance to finally get rid of him. It was a conspiracy. 
I think Maitland Council was using this kidnap thing to make sure that they really got rid of him. This may well have been the case. When the Heritage Mall was completed and took over, so did the rise of political correctness. The threat of any possible offensive behaviour, mixed with Graves' famous outgoing nature and strong beliefs, were constantly under the microscope. Soon the Maitland CBD management and local council decided to take a step back and distance themselves from John Brown, as the risks of being associated with the ageing icon were becoming too high. The organisations had once used him and his likenesses on everything, from letterheads to balloons and bumper stickers, became unreasonable and abandoned Jocko when he needed them the most. Soon the council and the CBD management stopped talking about it and the Maitland's little icon tag was born, out of necessity, when outsiders would inquire about it. Jocko Graves was now broken, unwanted, and seemingly unappreciated. The town that he gave so much for didn't seem to want to know about it. All night long, the young boy stood near frozen from the ice and though holding on to Washington's horses. The surprise attack on the garrison at Trenton was underway. Odd boy eventually froze to death whilst awake. Soldiers returned, never letting go of the reins. The boy was known as Jocko, and his father, Tom Graves, was amongst the 60 volunteer Negro troops in Washington's immediate command. It was said that the boy sacrificed spurred the troops' victory over the Trenton garrison. Washington was said to be so impressed by Jocko's heroism that he passed his story on to his officers, who in turn passed the story on to their men. In this fashion, Jocko's story was passed down through the ranks and served to inspire the rebel troops, restoring their hope and valour as if by magic. <laughs> charged the red coats and hairsons at Trenton, routing the garrison, killing and capturing over 1,000 royalists. Only four rebels died, two in battle and two frozen to death. The young Negro boy Jocko was counted among the latter. After the war and upon becoming the first president of the United States, George Washington returned to his estate at Mount Vernon. It was here that he ordered two sculptures to be erected commemorating America's great political and military crisis. One was a dove of peace, the other was a statue featuring a young Negro boy named Jocko, stepping bravely forward to hold the horses. It is this statue that became the origin for the now controversial 
lawn jockey statues, and similar horse hitching posts. This is where our story begins. Jocko is indeed a statue. He has been part of Maitland since 1866, when Friend and Company brought him as a gift to McDonald's tobacconists, outside whose Victorian shop from he has graced since 1956. He has since graced tourism magazine covers and pamphlets, bumper stickers, council letterheads, and numerous company advertisements. At one stage, anything to do with Maitland would not have been complete without an image of the little black boy. Yet, he has been replaced with bright images of coffee shops, vineyards and politically friendly imagery. Maitland is no longer regarded as an historic town, but that's another story. The fact that the black boy is no longer being used reinforces the notion that political correctness has rendered him obsolete. The fact that the little black boy tag is avoided when possible illustrates that the council is afraid to use his image during these politically correct times. Evidently, they're murdered by fear that they may be seen to promote black slavery or some other form of negativity against a black person. Yet, whether the legend of Jocko is true or not, the statue still represents something positive, and I personally feel that if his story gets out, that it might help to promote a greater understanding of the statue. The black boy. I reckon the black boy is a really good three-year-old and he could win the Melbourne Cup next year. Oh, oh the, the Maitland black boy. Oh, I reckon the Maitland black boy was a pervert. Because uh, every time I, I'd come home from the pub, when I bump into him, he gooses me. <laughs> Have you ever wondered what he originally was holding in his hand. Well, huh? Huh? Pervert. I have heard, I have heard that the Maitland black boy was actually a 48 year old pommy white man named Jocko Grimes, who was constantly covered in coal dust and wooden wash. And I know that for a fact because I got it from a copper and coppers don't lie. Well hang on, this is mate. Yeah well but maybe he wasn't a 48 year old white pommel midget. Maybe he was 49. White Americans want us to believe that Jocko represents an African American emancipated slave joining the fight with George Washington for independence. And as such, Jocko is a symbol used to inspire others to fight for what they believe in. He isn't an original piece. He had been mass produced, but since the advent of political correctness, a lot have been either destroyed or painted white. He is what is known as a lawn jockey, of which there are at least two versions. One is dressed in rags, and the other is minstrel-like and dressed as a jockey. Hence the term, lawn jockey. Both incarnations have become collector's items, and quite a lot have been painted white. A university in the US had problems with their own jocko, which was prominently featured out the front of their establishment. Many visitors would be instantly upset by the brazenly offensive statue, as they saw it. But once they read the plaque that outlined jocko's history, most would walk away with a new appreciation something Maitland CBD could well consider. This would explain the variations of the Jocko statues that I've seen over the years, from his traditional hitching post pose, like the one here in Maitland, to that of him holding a lantern. Jocko, or should I say the little black boy, is appreciated in some parts of the US, 
in a similar way that the Dogon Taka Box and Gundagai is here in Australia. Both represent loyalty in the face of death. All I can say is, let's bring back the black boy. Bring back the black boy. Keep walking off. Here we go. Action. <laughs> 